so you'll see on the screen right now um, some websites for that information. My uh, group website, thewoodcock.com. There's also one at, the, at uh, USS Chemistry Department, uh, charm.org, which is uh, obviously the, the home of the charm package. Um, and most importantly, you'll see at the very bottom, if you can, there's a link for documentation. So you can get access to the uh, latest charm documentation there, which would be very important if you want to actually go and start uh, running QMM calculations. And then obviously uh, q-chem.com, uh, uh, where you can find all you can find out all the information about QCHEM. So let's get started here. Okay, so as you'll see here, I mean, in, ter in general, in terms of modeling approaches, most of the webinars, obviously, that you guys have seen so far in the series, have been focused on things down in this range, right? Things that are are typically in the sub hundred atom range. Where you can reach time second, where you can reach time scales if you want to run simulations, you know, kind of up to the picosecond level, right? So you can study very short, uh, very fast uh, processes, you know, with things up to with atoms. Uh, I'm sorry, with, with systems up to say 100 atoms, right? But that's a very narrow scope of all of nature and all of the chemistry that we're interested in. Um, and as you get more and more interested in biological processes, you have to start moving up, you know, especially in along the x-axis, where you end up having to, you know, eventually leave quantum mechanics behind as your sole um, computational means. Right. So as you go up here, you move to the point to where you're going to end up with molecular simulations. So you're doing now classical MD, and then as you go up from there, you have to move into things like coarse grain modeling or mesoscale simulations where you're treating, you know, some group of particles as a single bead or a single particle, and then you describe those interactions. So, and then you'll see the time scales that we can kind of typically reach now with various types of methods. Obviously, the things that I'm going to be talking about today live in this overlap region. You'll see these overlap uh, regions here, but it lives in this overlap region between where you use QM and you use MM to, you know, use QM for uh, the quantum phenomenon that you need, and I'll talk about this just in a second, give some examples, and you use the classical model to make sure that your environment and, and the effects of your environment get included correctly. Okay, so why QMM then, right? So as, as I just stated, once you go past a certain number of atoms and a certain number, or a certain number of particles or electrons, you can no longer treat uh, systems fully quantum mechanical, especially with the types of techniques that I think most of QCHEM users and most um, quantum chemists are interested in things like part tree Fock or post part tree Fock methods, you know, obviously density functional theory um, and, and things like this, right? So, however, you can't just completely ignore the environment. So, what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to combine the, the, just the accuracy of the quantum mechanics with the, uh, with, with the um, classical treatment to get the environment. Right? So where this is important, obviously, is where you have you know, reaction pathways that occur in enzymes. Right? You have to have the environmental effects of the enzyme. I mean, that's the entire point of, of having enzymes. Right? They have evolved to, take, you know, to stabilize reactions in a way that you would not see in solutions. So if you want to model that, you have to account for the environment. Right? So you want to look at things like transition state stabilization right? So as a function of enzymes, which, which parts of the enzyme are helping uh, that reaction occur the most. Um, kinetic isotope effects. If you want, if you want to study these, right there, you need you need three energies. So, uh, kinetic isotope effects. Um, also, drug design. One of the one of the interesting things about you know going back up to transition state that people have been doing for years, especially from an experimental standpoint, using using kinetic isotope effects, is that they are they are looking at um, the way that transition states get stabilized. So Bern Schramm's group, um, you know, has, has been very famous for this. They look at ways transition states get stabilized, and then they start designing inhibitors, you know, or drugs, if you will, start designing inhibitors that will mimic those transition state interactions. And those tend to be um, very good inhibitors and very good, um, and very. Whoop. Okay. So. Uh, um, the, where are we going here? Okay, so mutagenesis, right? I'm sorry, guys. Somebody is somebody is messaging me, and I don't know how to turn it off. So 
So hopefully they'll stop here in a second. So um, allosteric effects, right? So if you want to look at mutagenesis, so if you want to, again, going back to transition state stabilization, if you want to look at as a function how a mutation, occur, you know, what mutations occur as part of a, um, as, um, right? So crystal crystallographers a lot of times will um, make mutations to try to determine the, the, uh, the mechanism, the, the, uh, the, the mechanism of these enzyme catalyzed reactions. And we can do the same thing, right? We can we can make the we can make the mutations in the environment, and then and then relook at reaction paths. For instance, allosteric effects, which we'll talk a little bit about about. And essentially, what we're saying is how protein motion or how environmental motion couples to say a reaction or some process to stabilize it or or um, inhibit it. Um, the next three things should be, or the next two things should be very obvious: excited states and, and, and radicals, right? Obviously, you're never going to get those things. Uh, right by by building classical models, All right? So, uh, and then finally, pKa calculations. Again, we're going to need free energies, and we need to have free energies of things to change, of things like, you know, protons moving around. Okay, so QM and then modeling approaches. Um, so obviously what we're doing is we're coupling quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics, and this is a little bit of a repeat of what I just said, um, is that we're treating the QM active site or some reacting center um, you know, obviously, with with the quantum mechanics, you know, where we can look at things like spectroscopy. Okay, so we're treat, you know, we're, we can look at spectro, you know, spectroscopy with that. So we can look at excited states, and this is when we get to this. When we talk later, you'll see that um, right. We we support things like time dependent PFT as a quantum method that couples with the classical methods, right? So we really can look at um, excited state properties inside of proteins. Um, you know, transition metals, obviously. I mean, I, I do, in my own research, I do a lot of stuff with porphyrins uh, and more particularly mean uh, groups. And um, we have to have the quantum mechanics there if we want to be able to treat um, these complex transition metals in the reactions. And then the, and then the MM environment, right, enzyme structure I already mentioned, but there's been more and more work, there's been more and more push to use these QMMM type methods. And I believe uh, Martin Head Gordon talked about this in his webinar. Um, you know, to, to look at, you know, metal organic frameworks or zeolite frameworks, right? So you have some process that's occurring inside of a framework, inside of a material, whether it be a catalysis, whether it be uh, gas sorption or something like this, and you can more accurately treat these interactions uh, at the QMMM level rather than just by parameterizing force fields. Um, and then bulky organometallic ligands is the same type of thing, and explicit solvent molecules. Okay, so let's get to some terminology that we'll see throughout. Um, here we have, right, we've called this, in, you know, just as a cartoon representation, we have this orange piece that we call our outer region. We have an inner region, right, and then we have some boundary region, right? So the outer region obviously is going to be modeled by MM type calculations or classical, right? It doesn't have to be, and as, as we'll get to a little bit later there, you know, you can, you can um, with some of the techniques that we've developed and, some, and, and implemented, uh, you can do these types of QM, QM, MM, or QM, QM calculations that, that have been popularized by Morikuma's group. Uh, these are also supported in QCHEM directly and through the QCHEM charm interface. So a QM, MM calculation, a QM calculation, you know, here in this inner small region, and then the boundary region will be needed if you're going to end up making cuts between things. So if you are dealing with proteins, for instance, you have to make a cut somewhere, right, because it's one long chain, you have to make a cut somewhere along, say, the protein backbone, or maybe cut side chains that would be included in your quantum calculation. Um, if you're dealing with simulations or calculations in explicit solvents, like a number of other QCHEM uh, developers and users are interested in, where you're really looking at just small molecule reactions or processes, and you want to accurately model solvent effects, then you, know, then you don't have to deal with these boundary regions, and that greatly simplifies things. Okay. So in general, we'll take a step back, because I, I hit on a couple of things already about QMMM and some distinctions. And let's just take a step back and make sure that we understand these distinctions. So um, QMMM is definitely part of a general multi-scale modeling approach, right? So it's good to base this in general multi-scale modeling in terms of some of the terminology. And there's a really good review uh, by Sherwood Brooks and Samson from a few years ago that, that talks about these kind of general multi-scale modeling approaches. 
And one of the things they highlight is that there are two main strategies that people will call multi-scale modeling. Uh, and it, and it, it will be sequential versus concurrent. Right? So sequential multi-scale modeling you could think of as I'm going to use quantum mechanics to, you know, to parameterize molecular mechanics force fields. Right? So I'm going to use more accurate information at a different, at a, at a different scale to, to uh, move to a, uh, to move to a different scale, right? So I'm going to use things on the electronic scale to move to something purely on the atomistic scale. Uh, concurrent multi-scale modeling is exactly that. Everything happens at once, right? So in sequential, you do QM, then you parameterize, then you run your MM. In concurrent, you run everything simultaneously. So your QM energies, right, or your QM Hamiltonians are being calculated at the same time your MM Hamiltonians are being calculated at the same time your interaction Hamiltonians are being calculated, right? And that's what this essentially means, right? So this is, you know, and then once you get in, once you get past the sequential versus concurrent, where we're going to be dealing with concurrent uh, multi-scale modeling in the QMMM regime, uh, you then have the further distinction where you could do additive or subtractive. So the additive method is mostly what we're going to be talking about today. The subtractive method is what many of you will know as this onion type approach, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that briefly. Um, so the additive method is just that, it's additive, right? We calculate a, Q, a quantum piece, we calculate a classical piece, and then we need to uh, treat, we need to, we need to account for the interaction between these two. And the way that we do that is through a Hamiltonian that looks like this, right? Where we take into account the interaction of classical point charges or your classical atoms on your quantum electrons. You take into account uh, the nuclear effects, right? So how the how the nuclear repulsion type interactions, right? So the nucleus of your of your classical atom or your MM atom interacting with the nucleus of your quantum atom, and then you have to deal with the van der van der Waal effects, right? So people who have been following along in the webinar series will no will no doubt know at this point there is a huge push in the quantum area to try to address essentially dispersion and accurate characterization of van der Waal complexes and van der Waal effects, right? So in QMMM, this is an important point, is that these are all handled at, you know, the, 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 the van der Waal interactions between the quantum region and the classical region are all handled at the classical level. Okay, let me say that again. That the, 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 you know, if you have a carbon atom in your quantum region, a carbon atom in your classical region, they interact through your standard your standard classical Leonard Jones potential, right? And the parameters for that have to come from some force field. They come, you know, obviously we use predominantly charm uh, in my group and the people I know, uh, but obviously people do this with amber and OPLS as well, but I think these are the three uh, most popular ones. Um, so, that's, so that's how this gets done. Obviously, your van der Waal and your dispersion effects purely inside of your quantum region will be handled by whatever quantum level of theory you choose to do your calculation. Okay, so now the subtractive method, right? The subtractive method is, is far easier um, to implement uh, and conceptually, right? Again, here you get the energy now. You're not dealing with Hamiltonians. You're just purely dealing with energies. You get energy of your quantum region, right? And then you get energy of your total complex at the classical level, and then you get the mm energy of your QM region, and then you subtract that off, right? And you can see very nicely graphically here, if, you, if this wasn't here, you would be double counting interactions, you know, here, right? You would count one as a quantum, and then here as a classical, right? You're doing this so that you can subtract off to prevent this double counting. And essentially what this, the big distinction between these is that the interaction that you see here is handled through this, through this Hamiltonian. The interaction that you see here between this orange bit and this orange bit on the inner and the outer is handled purely at the MM level. So if you have things that, um, if you have processes where you really need quantum polarization, right? You need polarization at the quantum mechanical level to accurately describe, these types of subtractive methods are going to be uh, you know, pretty dramatic failures. And we'll, we'll hit the strengths and weaknesses of these here in just one second. Okay, so I'll do a brief incomplete history because I know that as soon as I say um, 
if I have to qualify it, because there, I'm sure there, there are lots of contributions. This is a longstanding field at this point. There have been lots of contributions by people, and, I want, and um, in case I miss any, I don't want to uh, offend. So these, I just went through kind of and made some of the, uh, the major contributions, not just in Gaussian-based uh, QM approaches, right? So not just using Gaussian-based sets, but also using plane wave-based sets. And you'll see that stuff come in, right? So Ariel Varshall obviously is credited with um, essentially inventing this type of approach back in the uh, mid-70s, uh, where they studied interactions in lysozyme. Um, you know, then following, you know, in, in the uh, mid-80s, Carr and Parnello, you know, used plane wave DFT to do MD simulations, right? So they're starting to come into this, into this game. And then also around that time, uh, Peter Coleman, um, hooked up an ab initio package uh, with his Quest program using the Amber force field. And then soon thereafter, um, Field Bash and Carpalus, you know, fully implemented a semi empirical approach uh, into Charm. Um, you know, again, about half a decade later, Morikuma um, came up with this molecular embedding approach, right? This onion style approach. And there's some further development down here. Um, Walter Thiel also has made many contributions, predominantly uh, focusing on semi-empirical um, QMMM approaches. And then Ursula Russell, Russellsberger in uh, kind of the early 2000s, um, you know, made big pushes to do QMMM with the same type of CPMD approach rather than pure, rather than pure um, quantum calculations or pure quantum simulations. And then again, finally, Morikuma eventually um, extended this type of molecular embedding approach to, in, to include this electrostatic embedding. And what I mean by that is now you're, he's able to um, allow the, his quantum region to be polarized by his classical region, that the quantum region isn't just sitting out um, in, in space somewhere feeling no effects of its environment or, or, or feeling only effects of, it, of its environment at the classical level. Right? So, so it's been an improvement over that. So, you know, in general, additive energy expressions, we talked about these, so I won't, I won't spend a ton of time on them. They're here. If you have questions, um, you can ask. But, but the main thing I want to do is hit a couple of the advantages and disadvantages of, of each of these approaches. So the advantages for additive uh, QMMM is that you don't really require a force field. I said you need Van der Waal parameters, but that's, that's absolutely it. That's the only thing you need. If, so if you, have, if you have a very strange system where you um, have maybe elongated bonds or stretched bonds or, 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 or things that are um, bent in, in, a, in an odd shape. You don't have to worry about coming up with charges and bond parameters and angle parameters, dihedral parameters. All of that goes away because it's all handled at the quantum mechanical level. Um, so, and you naturally, there's a natural, with additive, with additive QMM, there's a natural way to include electrostatic polarization, right? The interact, which is essentially the interaction between, you know, the effects that the quantum region feels from the classical region, right? There's some disadvantages, right? When you truncate a region, right? When you truncate a region, you have to introduce, you know, what we call a link out. You know, I'm going to talk about this here in a second, right? Or some scheme of handling the fact that there is no longer a bond between, say, this atom in the outer region and this atom in the inner region, right? And the way that you handle these and include these into your Hamiltonian, right, your interaction Hamiltonians, these can get more and more challenging, right, the more advanced you get. And, and we'll see some, some, uh, some advancements here in a second. I'll, I'll give another brief historical perspective on that. Um, right, so, and then you have to worry about, as, as part of that, the problematic part of that is that you have to worry about how you handle that, right? How do you parameterize this atom, you know, that sits in here? You know, and how do you handle the interactions of this outer region with that and the inner region with this? You know, the applications are logical. I mentioned before, solvation effects of so things inside of explicit solvent, you know, enzymes, materials, right? So subtractive QMM. Right, again, here, here are the energy expressions. I'm not going to hit that uh, too much. Just want to go through the advantages and disadvantages, right? There are some advantages to attractive, you know, subtractive QMM. Um, you know, so one, it's easy. I mentioned this earlier. It's easy to implement. It's, you know, it's really straightforward to implement. Uh, potentially, um, you can get things that are very high accuracy because, as I said, you can do these approaches where it's not QMMM, but it's maybe QM, QMMM. So you can build more advanced um, 
quantum mechanics into very important regions, say things like metals. And then the surrounding part of that, you can have, say, maybe DFT or even a semi-empirical approach. And then the very far, um, you know, the things that are much farther away handle at the classic level. So there can be some examples where it, it, it's very accurate. Um, and that's what I mean here by this QM, QM, QM schemes. Um, and there are no interactions between link atoms and MM centers. This is, this is nice. Even when, they, even when they make their cuts, right, when you're dealing with mechanical embedding, right, when you make your cut, right, now your quantum part just sits in space. You don't have to worry about how that link atom now interacts with the classical part or your environmental part. Uh, there are obviously some disadvantages. Um, the largest being that the largest being that um, you well uh, the, I'd say these are about equal, but one being that you really have to have a good force field for your quantum region, right? Because again, because your interactions in the subtractive approaches are handled between you look down here at the bottom, you can see this little my little cartoon again. You know the interaction between your quantum region and your classical region are only handled at the classical level. Therefore, if you have, if you, again, if you have something that is not well described by a force field, it's not going to be interaction of that with, with other uh, force field atoms, with other classical atoms, won't be well described either probably. So you really can have some catastrophic failures uh, in those cases. And obviously, in the mechanical embedding approach, again, you don't get polarization of your quantum region, right? Your quantum region really doesn't feel an effect of your of your um, environment, right? An explicit effect. It feels this implicit effect, which comes in at, from the classical treatment, and that again can be that. That again can lead to to many failures when you're dealing with systems that um, really need accurate polarization of the quantum region to describe, you know, some effect. And they have the same applications, right? It's the, it's the you know it's the same type of application: solvations, enzymes, materials. People have used uh, attract, you know, additive and subtractive for both. Okay, so I alluded to the difficulties dealing with these link atoms and boundary treatments. And if you look at this list, you'll see, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of work that's been done um, to try to overcome this. And it's, and it's pretty, you know, and it's, and, it's, and it's pretty complicated, a lot of these approaches. Uh, the first way that, the first approach, which again, this goes back to that 1986 paper from Singh and Coleman, um, is the single link atom approach. And it is by far the simplest, it's the most transferable, um, it's probably also the least accurate, um, but, maybe not, but maybe not terrible. Um, and what you do there is just as I had in my little cartoon on the previous slide, is you, you cut a bond, and then you basically cap the quantum region with a single hydrogen atom, and that's it. The classical region stays, um, the valency stays unfilled, and then you, and then you manipulate your your, inter your interaction energy uh, potentials such that uh, you scale those, or remove those interactions, and we'll talk we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, right, a double link atom approach, uh, which was a, a later by uh, Bernie Brooks and co-workers uh, with his Gaussian blur, and these two I'll talk about. I'll, I'll say in a second, but uh, these are both implemented obviously in the QCAM charm interface, um, and we'll you know, and I'll talk mainly about those for today. But the idea here is that instead of leaving your, right, it's called a double link atom, right? So instead of leaving your, your MM valency unfilled, you also add a hydrogen on the MM side. So now you have two link atoms across a single bond cut. And then this Gaussian blur is, is a way to, um, you know, treat these quantum mechanical point charge interactions, right? So what happens there is you, you blur the point charge, so instead of treating the point charge as a delta function, as a single localized center of charge, you make it look like a diffuse center of charge, you know, essentially a Gaussian, right, a Gaussian function. You know, I'll, give a, I'll give a description of this uh, a little bit later as well. And then you have this long list of approaches that deal not with necessarily capping things with real atoms, but capping things by manipulating the the orbitals or the electrostatics that occur at the MM side of a bond cut, right? So what happens is you want that MM side to, you know, you want in theory the quantum region to see that MM atom, that first MM atom that you cut, right? So let's look down here, right? 
So if you have this MM atom right here, you want you know this this quantum part to really get the effects of this, right? So what what um, you know Jolly Gal and coworkers, um, uh, Reveal coworkers, Friesner, uh, Wei Tao Yang and and Yi Han have done in a, in, a, in, a, in a series of different approaches is that they somehow use an orbital type of approach, you know, to fix or freeze or set something that looks like a real carbon orbital, you know, sitting on this atom, right? So White Tao Yang uses, you know, pseudo potentials, right? So he uses ECPs essentially, you know, to do this. He puts an ECP here that mimics what a, you know, what a carbon, you know, what that carbon orbital looks like or those carbon orbitals look like. Um, Rich Friesner freezes these. Right, and there are these other series of approaches. And here's a couple of good reviews that discuss some of these uh, boundary treatments and the strengths and weaknesses of them. But as I said, today we're going to be focusing on these two because these are the two that are supported in the interface. And I think by far these are probably the most common uh, because you know these number a lot of these approaches down here are harder to implement. Um, but they but they also have you also have to worry about reparameterizing you know, what, what um, your orbitals look like on your truncated region for every different calculation you want to do, for every different cut you want to make. So transferability of these, I think, has led to the popularity largely. Okay, so how do we decide on a region, right? So we want to create a QM region. If you're talking about a protein, if you're talking about some amide bond or whatever, we want to create a QM region that is of neutral charge if we can. Right, we want to try to get a neutral charge region, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Right, it it, it limits the uh, the the excess polarization effects that you can get by by having point charges very close to QM atoms. I mean, by uh, very close to uh, wave functions. And it also helps to um, it also just improves the performance of quantum methods. Quantum methods tend to perform better if you're dealing with things that are, you know, that are non-charged you know, with, with um, multiplicities of one. So here's an example of something we would cut. And then here's a little cartoon for this, right? So here are our QM atoms right here. And then we stick link atoms, right, on the QM region, you know, to fill out its valency. And then we leave the MM region, which is here in orange, we leave those dangling. And the way that you handle the electrostatics in CHARM, and I think this is done predominantly, right, across a series of programs, is although there, there are some advanced charge shifting schemes and, and uh, things that Walter Thiel and Paul Sherwood have worked on uh, and Don Trular, but um, but I, I think maybe this um, you know this EXGR the so-called EXGR approach um, is maybe the most popular. Which and all that does is it it excludes the group's electrostatics. So what that means is that this atom right here does not feel all of the charges on this region right here essentially get set to zero for this, you know, for, for this atom interacting with things over here. So you just throw out all of the electrostatic interactions of, you know, of your quantum region, you know, with this neighboring, with the, with the closest group. And the closest group has, has meaning in terms of how you, um, how you define the topology of your system, right? So you can, you can, you know, this is controllable by the people who uh, define the topologies. So let's say this may be a single group, right? And if this is a single group right here, then the interaction of this hydrogen with this would be set to zero, but the hydrogen would be interacting with this carbon atom over here. So if there are any questions about this, just let me know. Um, and you can read about this, obviously, in some of those, in some of those reviews. And so with the double link atom, obviously, as I said before, is you don't just cap the quantum region, you cap the MM region, right? But now this becomes a little bit more complicated in terms of how you deal, how you deal with the electrostatics and what, you, and what uh, to throw out and what to throw out in which direction, right? So the way that, um, you know, Bernie Brooks and coworkers have chosen to handle this is by implementing this delocalized Gaussian MM charges or these blurred Gaussian charges. And this essentially overrides the need to use this group electrostatic um, exclusion approach. And what that what happens here is, right, this is what you would see. You would make your cut, fill your valencies on both sides, and then this is kind of what your calculation would look like, right? 
where each one of these little dots, I'm representing point charges. Right? So instead of it being a real atom, it's just a point charge of what you would see in your calculation. Right? So instead of it being a point charge, it actually then gets blurred and turned into a Gaussian function. Right? So the charge now is much more diffuse. Right? And the diffuse nature of this charge means that, and these can be tuned in such a way that now this hydrogen does not feel a very local charge. It feels a very diffuse charge. And that is the type of interaction that you would expect even maybe at the quantum level, right? Hydrogen interacting with some group would not necessarily feel, you know, a very localized effect. It, it would feel a diffuse effect. And that's the idea of this, is that, is that they're trying to, um, they were trying to mimic um, the correct nature of quantum interactions, you know, by, by diffusing the charge. Okay, so let's recap the overall approaches um, that we've talked about, that I've talked about so far, and then I'm going to get into some practical um, and hands-on stuff to where we, we see scripts and see how things are actually set up. Okay, so uh, again, I've talked about essentially two ways of doing, you know, this concurrent style multi-scale modeling or concurrent QMMM, right? One is the subtractive approach, onion-like things to where MM calculation is done of the whole system, right? And that describes your interaction between your your so-called quantum region and your classical region. And then the quantum calculation uh, just gets pulled out into space, gets done by itself, and that gets repeated at the MM level, and then you do a subtraction to prevent double counting. Again, we talked about the strengths and weaknesses. Um, and the additive approach, right, we do the quantum calculation, we add its, we add its energy or its, or its Hamiltonian to the classical Hamiltonian or the classical energy, and then you have to deal with this interaction energy. And, and, the, you know, and the various boundaries, right? And the interaction energy between your QM and MM regions, right, are done, you know, explicitly, or fall out explicitly in such a way that you include, you know, that you get this quantum electrostatic influence. And we call, you know, and this is the so-called electrostatic uh, embedding type of idea, right? Um, also, as part of this, you allow, which I didn't really talk about, um, you know, the MM region also responds to what the QM region is doing, right? So the MM region is actually getting polarized as the, you know, you know, as a function of your quantum mechanical method and your wave function. So, and this is done, and if there are questions about how this actually gets implemented, it's no problem. Essentially, we calculate charges, right? We calculate electrostatic potentials, and then we get the electric potential. Um, at these, we get, you know, the gradient of the electrostatic potential, and that just turns in, the negative of that is, is the, um, you know, is the electric field. So we can get the electric field and then, and then get the gradient of the electrostatic potential very easy. And, and those methods are implemented in QCHEM, obviously, which made, which made doing this and modification um, of the code, you know, you know easier, definitely. Um, so there are also problems, right? You have to be careful when you use these polarization methods. You have to be careful about how you include, um, you know, boundary treatments. And so it's just, again, this is just a warning. Um, that this is that this is a problem that's been uh, going on for a while now, and there really is no one uh, perfect solution to this. Each person has developed, um, you know, or, or or kind of fallen in favor with one type of method, you know, largely on that list um, that I showed. And they each, and again, I didn't go into that. But they each have their own strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so. Let's go from, let's assume that you want to do QMMM on a protein. This is, this is my fundamental assumption. If it's, if, if it's different for people who may be interested in materials, then you know, some of this stuff will have to change. But it, this, regardless, this should give you a good, a, a good framework um, from which to, um, to, to, to start. So from the PDB, right, where we have our protein crystal structures, you know, to doing QMMM simulations or calculations, this is what we're going to try to get through. Okay, and what one what one thing that we've done is we've developed, you know, an interface to Charm, you know, through a web-based, uh, you know, a web-based interface to Charm, which, in ideally, will help facilitate this process an awful lot, right? And I'm going to go through how we, you know, what scripts we use in our protocol that we use um, on the back end, right? And so using something like this will will be able to get you a long way on your step to doing QMMM. Um, and then obviously it's not, it's not flawless, so if you run into problems, um, I'm going to walk through the procedure so you'll know how to, uh, and the scripts are all provided. Um, 
So this will get you a good head start on moving forward. And some of the things that we've done that is, I think will be particularly helpful is, you know, having a nice visualizer so you can actually see how your system is, is progressing through the setup stages. Um, the other thing that we just implemented is, is the ability to, to um, you know, to build ligands directly through the website. And this will be, this will be useful for, um, I see this being predominantly useful for people who want to set up simulations or calculations where you have a solvated ligand, right? You have some solvated molecule and you want to run a simulation to study the solvation effects, the explicit solvation effects. So these types of things, um, you know, are, are there and they're being developed. This isn't available yet. Um, and there we have a website, charming.org, which is an older version. And then we have um, a rather uh, uninventive name, uh, charming.org slash new charming, which is uh, essentially the beta version of the site that will be migrated over uh, to full production soon. And this was described in a publication in 2008. So actually, so one thing I would like to say about this, you know, one of the goals of this, you know, from a protein point of view, because the other thing we've done recently, is inter you know, um, we've added uh, uh, molecular dock, you know, into proteins. Um, so this can be tied into this ligand builder. One of the nice things, the, you know, the goal, the long-term goal of this is, is really to give people the ability to say, okay, I've got a protein and I, I want to study some ligands, you know, you know, or some for some reactions that a catalyzer or some ligands that bind, yet there's no, there are no structures available. So you can actually come in, right, do the docking, you know, build the ligand, do the docking with your protein that you get from the PDB, you know, run some simulations, look at them, and then start doing QMMM for reactions or excited states or, or whatever uh, process you're interested in. Um, okay, so Let's start looking at some files and, and what you'll really see as you, as you uh, move along on this process. So first thing you'll want to do is you'll, you'll, need to, you'll need to identify a protein, right? So you'll download the PDB. You'll split the protein, right? This is what Charming does on the back end, right? So if you don't do it through Charming, it's probably, you're probably going to want to do this yourself. So you'll split the protein into chains, right? Uh, into the protein chains, into things like heteroatoms, you know, and salt. So your protein chains would be your protein. Heteroatoms would be things like water or if there are any salt ions that have been crystallized with it. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, that's solvent. Solvent would be water if there, and if there are any uh, uh, you know, salt ions that may be crystallized. And heteroatoms are, would be things like your ligands that would be bound you know, into the active sites. Okay, so, um, and then we generate PSF. And for people who are not familiar with CHARM, which I'm guessing that's probably the majority here listening, um, I'll just take it aside to explain what, what this, this terminology. So PSF means protein structure file, okay? And this gets built, and here's an example of what a protein structure file looks like. You see it down here, right? It, it tells you information about the sequence. It gives you information about your residue, about what type of atom you're dealing with. Right? This is an atom identifier, just a number. You know, it gives you the charge of the atom, it gives you the mass, and then it gives, you know, some extra information that you can, that the user can control out here. But this right here is the main part of the information. It gives the number of atoms, you know, in it, right? So you have charge, you have mass, and you have the atom type, which then gets, which controls how uh, energy gets calculated through the parameters. Okay, so to build a PSF, you, have, you need two things. You need an RTF and a PRM file. An RTF file is a residue, to, a residue topology file, is what that stands for. And the PRM is just shorthanded for parameters, you know, or parameter file. Now, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, and you'll need these for each, the protein chains, the header atoms, and the salts, right? And here is what these look like, right? So here on the left is a, is a, would be an example of something from an RTF file, right? This is an alanine residue, so it, it gives you kind of the overall structure of what alanine looks like tells you your atom types, it tells you, it gives you names to these atom types, and then it gives you the charge of them. And the most important thing is it does is it tells you how everything's bonded. So stuff down here, right? So stuff, you know, so stuff down here, right? It tells you how things are bonded. It says there's a double bond O, C here. Um, so it gives you information like this. And the parameter file is exactly what you think it is. This is an example of just some bond parameters says that there's a, you know, that there's a bond between CY and CA, 
right? The force constant element is 350, and then the and uh, the default parameter would be 1.3650 angstroms, right? And then these, you know, the two of these get applied, and then you get back to where you can actually generate this PSF file. Okay, so this is very easy for proteins. As it turns out, for proteins, Charm is, is very automated at this. However, if you're here to learn about doing QMMM, you probably are interested in calculating the quantum region out of things that are not proteins, right? They're going to be small molecules. They're going to be ligands. They're going to be heme groups. They're going to be iron and sulfur clusters. They are not going to be standard parts of proteins. And that's where we get into generating parameters and auto-generating parameters. And thank goodness there are some easy tools uh, that have been developed to help us out with this, right? So once you generate all of these PSFs, one, one for your protein, one for your heteroatom, and one for your solvent, we then we, we combine all of these to generate a total structure, and I'll show you how this is done. Right? And this is how a typical charm script would look. Right? And don't necessarily have to worry about the, um, the syntax. One of the things you will notice if you've seen any Fortran code, you'll see that the syntax for charm commands, this because this is a charm input file, the syntax for charm commands like this uh, looks an awful lot like old Fortran because Charm is written in Fortran and they were writing Charm at the same time they were writing their input parser and you know this, it's not surprising that this happens. Okay, so you have to read in your RTF file. You have to read in your parameter file. This is these are one of the things I said. And again, don't don't get caught up in the in the nomenclature. If you if you have questions, I'll certainly answer about it. But the Charm documentation can explain this. Um, and I'll, I'll give a better resource um, on how to get started here in a second. Um, okay, now you read in, you look at your PDB file. So you have some PDB file, and what you have to do is you have to read the sequence, right? So what you do is you have to, what this command does is it looks in your PDB file and it says, okay, I have 10 alanines. And it knows, and it knows from, you know, the RTF file up here how to make 10 alanines, what they should look like. Right, and then you generate these. Then you generate your 10 alanines. And then once you generate these, right, now you can read in the actual portent of Right, and then finally, you know, what this does is it does a test to see if there are anything, if there are any coordinates that are not initialized. So were there any failures in, as part of this process? Right, was, did, a, did a carbon atom not get read in correctly? And then a bit, and what this series of commands does down here is it sets up your internal coordinates, and most importantly, it builds in the missing hydrogens, right? Because from, from crystal structures, unless you're operating in a super high resolution down in the 0 0.8, 0 0.7 range of, uh, of X-ray structures, you do not see hydrogen positions, right? You only, you only get heavy atom positions. So, what, so Charm has a series of routines, you know, that can build these in for you, um, you know, relatively accurately. However, what we do here is, is we don't necessarily rely on that, is we build them in and then we fix, right, what this command is doing is it's fixing all the heavy atoms and then we run a very short minimization to allow the hydrogen positions to, uh, to relax, to optimize. And then we remove the, we remove the, um, you know, the, we remove this constraint and then we just do an energy calculation and we save a final PSF and a final set of coordinates, okay? So the COR format or CRD format is a card format and that is unique to Charm. Um, BMD, the, the, the Visual Molecular Dynamics tool, which I'm sure many of you have used and are using, um, you know, BMD can read, you know, both of these formats, you know, PSF and TR natively. Um, largely that's because, VM, you know, NAMD, which is the, the MD engine behind BMD, it, you know, it, it was largely built um, modeling Charm. I mean, Charm is a very old code, code. I haven't really talked about the history of Charm, but it's a very old code, and a lot of MD packages, you know, will have similar types of uh, pieces uh, or similar types of behavior to Charm because Charm is one of the first. Okay, so now that we have, we now we have our protein set up. Now we've got to deal with our ligands, right? So now we have a different topology and parameter file, and these, these CGNFF. What this stands for is Charm Generalized Force Field, right? And this is these are parameters that were um, that were developed by Alex McCarroll's group um, at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, 
you know, to specifically try to target, you know, small molecules, you know, drug-like molecules, inhibitors, uh, you know, you know, first-row organic type molecules that a lot of people care about, either for running direct simulation just because they care about organic properties, or you know, or, or properties of organic molecules, or if you care about binding these things into proteins to, you know, to agonize or antagonize some behavior. Okay, so we have. Um, a specific RTF and a specific parameter file, you know, for, for our ligands, and we do the same procedure, right? We read in our ligands, uh, we figure out what the sequence is, we generate it, you know, and then we save out, you know, then we save out some coordinates. Uh, I'm sorry, we read in, we read, we finally read, I'm sorry, we generate, we read in the coordinates, um, and then we so on and so forth, like we did before, right? We save out the PSF, we can do some minimization, you can do whatever you want to at this point. But this will get your coordinates of your ligand that read it. Okay, so I, you know, I mentioned this, you know, getting these parameters, right? These files right here, the, your automatic um, topology and parameter generation. And there are a couple of tools that we've implemented in Charming and that have been developed externally to do this. One is is Paramkim. This is a website uh, developed by by Alex McCarroll directly and a series of collaborators that you can upload molecules to. You can upload small molecules, and it will automatically generate, you know, charm, RTF, and PRM files. Okay, and then those can be stuck right in to these scripts that uh, that we're going through now. All right, and this is what it looks like, right? Again, we're back to a residue, you know, just just some topology information, um, and you know, and then here's a parameter file, right? Again, we're dealing with bonds. Again, it's just some different atom types. You know, a force constant, and your, you know, your default, you know, your 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 R naught, your X naught value, right? Your default bond length. The nice thing about one of the nice things about Paramkim is it provides you these penalties. You know, based upon it, based upon its automatic generation of these parameters, and then it gives you some, um, it gives you some confidence. You know, that they've tested, right? So penalties lower than 10, they say it's pretty good. Penalties between 10 and, I'm sorry, penalties between 10 and 50. You know, they say, you know, take a look at those. Make sure that nothing is too screwy. Um, and then penalties that are higher than 50, you know, they say, okay, you better, you, you, you'll want to look at this pretty carefully to make sure, you know, that, that what you're, that you're doing what you want to be doing. So it's a way of quantifying uh, the accuracy of, of the parameters that they generate. Uh, an alternative um, scheme to do this, but it, that is still based in this charm generalized force field is, um, this multi-purpose atom type for charm match uh, as the acronym. Uh, this is developed by Charlie Brooks's group. Um, so not too old, right? This was first published in 2011. They have a web server for this, but they also um, they also have a Perl package that you can download and run this um, locally. So and it does the same type of thing, right? It, it goes through and it generates. The, the one difference is that it, this doesn't generate the penalties. This doesn't generate the penalties to give you. Uh, um, to give you some estimate about how good they think the parameters are. But besides that, it's largely, um, they're largely producing very similar results, um, you know, with the same type, with the same force field. And there was a paper published um, subsequent to 2011 where, you know, Charlie's group um, did a series of analyses, you know, of how good, you know, how good their um, auto parameter generation works by looking at things like solvation free energies, pizza formation, and stuff like this. Okay, so at this point we have what? We have a working PSF file for the protein, and we have a working PSF in, or working PSF important file for our protein, and we have you know which we see down here, right? And we have a working PSF file for our ligands, right? That we see down here, you know, and our in our coordinates for our protein and ligands, right? So now we just combine everything that we just did, those two, those two scripts, we combine, you know, the reading in together. So we read in the protein part, the topology and the parameters, right? We read in the ligand part, the topology and the parameters, right? And the individual ones, right? Because again, I should state, these are just general, this is the general force field, right? The specific stuff to your, to your particular ligand exists here. And what it does is it uses information that's built into these guys, right? So this uses this information, um, you know, to, to, to work correctly. 
Okay, so now you have your topology of your protein, your topology of your ligands, the coordinates of both, and then you can add these all together. So at this point now, you have a protein built with a ligand inside of it, and you're ready to start running calculations. Right? And here, I'm going to go very quickly through this because this really is um, you know, a standard type of procedure that you can download the scripts from Charming um, or Charm Tutorial I'll talk about and get this going pretty quickly. Once you have, you know, once you have this right here, once you have these guys created, getting through this next stage is, is really uh, rather straightforward to kind of uh, follow the bouncing ball, right? But the idea is that you want, you don't have a protein in gas states, right? You, have, you, you need to put your protein in some explicit water, right? KIT3P is a very common explicit water model, okay? So we have that, and then we neutralize the system Right? And the only reason we do that is because we're using, when we're running simulations, we're, we're most of the time using this particle mesh UL. We're using periodic boundary conditions. And a, and a consequence of this, or an artifact of this, is it really doesn't like having total systems that are charged. So one of the things we do is we neutralize by adding, by adding salt ions in, in differing numbers uh, to get to a desired concentration and to make sure things are neutral. Okay, and then we can run some short minimization, you know, classically, or you can restrain things, um, and then you know you can restrain your Q in the region and run and run everything else, um, you know, just straight classical minimizations, just to alleviate some bad contacts. And then now we do our, you know, we want to make sure that things are, you know, we well equilibrated and the system is stable before we start doing QMMF. And the way that we do that, right, we take something that essentially is now in very low temperature range that comes from the crystal, that comes from the uh, PDB, right? A lot of, most of those are in kind of the 100 uh, K range um, of temperatures, and we want to get it up to room temperature. So we do this heating procedure. And um, again, I'm not going to go through this, but you know, this is just a bullet list about how, how this works. Um, and then once you get it thermally equilibrated, so once you, once you are happy and you are convinced that um, all of the heat in the system in raising it, say, from 100K to 300K has been equally just uh, distributed, right? Then you can go to start running equilibration or production dynamics, um, you know, and then there you repeat, you know, you repeat these first four steps, and then you issue some command that looks massive and scary like this, right? And here is a list of all of the things this is doing. It. I'm certainly not going to go through this, but just so you realize all of the moving pieces that go into running a molecular dynamic simulation. Um, you can see this. Um, so at this point, at, you know, after you run these simulations, you know, now you're ready to start doing QMM minimizations or QMM simulations, um, you know, because your system in theory is relatively stable. Um, like I said, a resource, you know, the charm documentation is helpful as a, as a reference guide. Uh, but this charmtutorial.org that um, I list here, here's a picture of the website. Um, this is a this is a much better um, way to get started. Right? This really walks you through all of the basics of charm um, and gets you ready, you know, through the molecular di dynamics portion that we're talking about here, and gets you to where to what I just went through. So you really can um, start doing your QMA, right? So the way that you do this, right, is you, again, you have to read in all of this information, and then you need to worry about link atoms, right? So you worry about link atoms, um, you have to define your QM region, right? Then you set up, then you have to tell QChem how to deal with this. And then you run whatever types of calculations you want to run. And I have a little example here, right? So obviously, you know, this thing here that's a little bit bigger, that's bound into this protein, this would, this would be something like my QM region, right? And maybe I want to model a reaction of this thing being deprotonated by this histidine, right? So this would be in my QM region, right? So I have to define exactly what atoms are in my QM region uh, before moving forward. And this is how this looks, right? Oh, yeah, and if, and if you want to, and if you put this histidine in your QM region or you put this asparagine in your QM region, right, here is where maybe you would cut a bond, right? You would cut across a very, you know, a neutral bond, right? Typically only cut across carbon-carbon bonds. And what, what that would look like, again, you read, in your, you read in your protein information, you get your protein information read into charm, and then here's the command that would add a link atom. And what it does is it takes a hydrogen-type link atom and it, it attaches it 
to, um, you know, your carbon alpha carbon that you maybe cut. So maybe if I, like if I do cut here, and this is, you know, and this is a, you know, carbon alpha, and this is a carbon, and this is a carbon, right? You would make that cut, and you would, oops, wrong way. You see that I'm attaching my link atom to my carbon alpha, and then my carbon is my MM part, and it's just going to be dangling. Okay? Um, and then we use this lone pair command. And this lone pair, and what this command does is it applies a constraint, and it keeps the hydrogen atom that you add, it keeps it in line between those two carbon atoms, right, collinear. So it makes sure that that new atom, this QQH atom, is, stays on this straight line. And this scaling parameter basically is, what you're doing is you're scaling the distance of the carbon-carbon, right? So you're saying that I believe the carbon-hydrogen distance is, is 0.7125 of the carbon-carbon distance. And that is the constraint that you're going to place as you're running these calculations, right? And then the command, you know, this you have to give it the, which three atoms you want, right? So I'm not going to go into chart atom selection. Obviously, this is this, this, would, this is a, a, a much longer uh, topic, obviously. But the charm tutorial does do this. So on the QKIN side, what you need is you need um, you need to tell it four charm needs to know four different things. It needs to know what this and the, and the most important things are underlined. This QKIM control file, QKIM CMT. And what this is, is this is where you put all of your room variables. So all of the, all of the options you want QCHEM to do, like so you want to use B3LIP versus Hartree 5. That information goes here. QCHEM is QCHEM EXE. This is just the QCHEM command. This is the command that you issue if you went to the command line and wanted to run a QCHEM job. Right? So typically, right, there's a, there's a script called QCHEM that gets distributed, and most people say QCHEM, you know, input, output, and that's how they run it. These two files get generated by charm, so you don't need to, to know anything, and I'll, and I'll talk more about those here in just a second. You know, here are some non-bond issues. Uh, the non-bond setup, again, um, not important for, for right now. And define your QM region, right? And then you issue the QCAM command. And there are several pieces here, right? So there's the remove, there's the EXGR, and then there's your selecting, which, selecting the QM region you know, that you want, you know, selecting the atoms that you actually want to run QM on. The remove command essentially tells Charm not to, not to count the classical electrostatics inside of the QM region, right? So your, you know, in a quantum calculation, a carbon-carbon bond is handled, you know, as a wave function, right? What this is saying is also don't count, don't count you know, the charge-charge interactions or the classical electrostatics, right? handle everything at the quantum mechanical level. The EXGR we talked about earlier, because we added a link atom, you know, is excluding the electrostatics on the, on the neighboring groups as you, you know, as you run these calculations. And then you do a minimization. Okay, and here is what the QCHEM control file looks like. Okay, this is what it looks like. Again, as I said, you define all of your rim variables. And there are certain, there are several of these that you really need, right? So, this you need. This is variable, but if you're running an, if you're running an, uh, an optimization or a molecular dynamic simulation, you need to have this set to force. Um, symmetry off. Uh, that prevents the um, the molecule, the quantum molecule, from being reoriented as the calculation starts. Sim ignore is uh, true. No, actually, I'm sorry. These are, these are backwards. The sim ignore prevents the reorientation. Um, and then print input is false. And the reason I say this is that the reason this, the reason this keyword is here is because QCAM echoes back the input that you give it to run a calculation. For instance, all the atoms that it knows about. Because if you've got 30,000 point charges, you do not want those echoed back in an output file. That alone can take two minutes. So that, that's not very smart. Um, so QMM and print is true. That, turn, that also turns off. Uh, some of the excess printing that is that is done associated with having 30,000 atoms, uh, and then you can control your SCF convergence. You know, I set it to seven. You know, for most of these things, I think there's paper by a series of papers by uh, John Herbert and Ryan Steele and, and Martin Ed Gordon that you know that looked at energy conservation and QMMM simulations as a function of that. And seven, I think, was is actually a little bit above what they needed to be. I think six is actually 
what they found is actually being pretty good uh, to conserve energy. Uh, and here now you set your charge and multiplicity of your quantum region. Right? And this is what your q1.imp file looks like. This gets automatically generated by charm. Right? So obviously this is all the same. But what you'll notice is now you have, uh, this is for a different one, right? I mean, I'm doing the water dimer. That, that other one is from a different calculation. But you have the charge and multiplicity, but now you have the atomic information put in here for the thing that you selected as your quantum region and the atomic information of what you selected for your classical region, right? So these are the x, y, z coordinates, and these are the charges, right? So this is a water, right? You have oxygen with a minus 0.8, and you've got hydrogen, you got two hydrogen with plus 0.4. So we're doing a water dimer here, right? And this is what a charm, this is what the output from charm would look like if you run this calculation. You know, it echoes back to you that you're running a b 3 lib 631 g star calculation, it tells you that it knows, it understands what the quantum atoms are, and it's assigned them as oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, you know, that you've given it, and then it computes the calculation. And here is your total charm energy, and here is your quantum energy, right? And then the, here, here are classical pieces, right? So you get your angle energy from charm, from the classical part of charm, you get your bond energy and your, your van der Waal energy from charm, and then this is the root mean squared gradient. But this tells you how optimized this thing is, right? So one of the things you'll notice here is that that number is gigantic compared to what you typically see in QChem output files. Well, this is in kcals per mole, uh, not in not in atomic units. So you have to so keep that in mind, obviously. Um, so to to kind of get close, you know, to finish up here, um, I want to kind of give an overview of of what functionality exists, you know, using these types of approaches. Um, especially with the release of 4.1, there have been some new things added that really I think will uh, dramatically improve the functionality. Uh, one being that, that now the, 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 there's fully multi-threaded parallel calculations for you know, hartree fock and DFT. With, I think what this means is that the TDDFT is being worked on and I think that's going to be released in a, um, in a, in a, in a subsequent, um, in a, in a subsequent uh, point release. But obviously, Yihan and Zinting will know more about this than me. Um, but right now, it works for Hartree Fock and DFT. So this, and this scales really well. So now you can really start to do larger and larger QM systems, larger and larger QM MM systems, you know, with better and better scaling. Right? It supports a number of uh, post Hartree Fock methods. RIMP2 is, is um, also done efficiently. This is also, you know, parallelized in CCSD if you want to be able to do you want to be able to do some of these highly accurate QMMM calculations, you can do that. Also, we've also there's the ability in Charm to do onion type calculations, so these subtractive type, which I'm just, I'll just show you a paper of that very briefly. Um, but this means that you now can do CCSD, you know, for say some small region, you know, do DFT for a larger region, and then do and use Charm's MM, you know, for you know solvent or more of the protein. You can also do even more accurate, but only energy supported for uh, CCSD parentheses T, uh, for instance, local MP2. And one of the things that I've worked um, with uh, Yi Han on, and I'll highlight here in just a second, very briefly, is um, implementing QMMM analytic uh, second derivatives and applying, you know, and, 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 um, and, and schemes to apply these, right? And so what's really important also is that these now are going to also be fully, oh, I missed the T here, but these are going to also be supported on the, multi, on the multi-threaded, I believe. Um, I'll let uh, Yihan or Zintin correct me if I, if I misstated that um, in, in the 4.1. This definitely is, I believe this is as well, but uh, I'll let them correct me on this if I'm wrong. But again, so this, now we're really starting to get into um, the types of you know, the types of real world applications that I, that I talked about on kind of that second and third slide, right? We can look at, we can calculate, you know, free energies of processes, you know, by using normal mode approaches or using QMMM second derivatives. And that information can get us things like kinetic isotope effects, uh, PKAs, right? So we're really starting to get into that area where this is, this is becoming possible. Um, I'll highlight very briefly that this work was all originally done and published uh, back in 2007 uh, in this paper with a series of people here, 
uh, myself and Bernie Brooks and Peter Gill and Andrew uh, helped out a ton, and we implemented some reaction path methods, which I may do a uh, follow-up webinar on some, you know, uh, later in the summer uh, on, on how to do these reaction path type calculations inside of this. Um, but essentially, they're, you know, it's, it's a replicated method, and I won't go into the details, obviously, but you can, you know, read about it, and I'll share the papers. <clears throat> Um, and then the work that I've done with Yihan uh, has been, you know, related to this, to uh, QMMM, uh, the most recent work with Yihan has been related to these QMMM frequency calculations, you know, back in 2008, 2011, where we have, you know, trying to come up with efficient and accurate ways to get QMMM free energies, you know, through normal mode analysis. Uh, and this is just getting better and better. Um, and then finally, this M scale paper that got published in 2011. Um, this this is this generic multi-scale modeling or general multi-scale modeling in Charm, and this will allow you to do onion type calculations uh, in Charm. So this will this is the framework inside of Charm. Uh, and again, I didn't I didn't show any scripts to talk about this too much, but this will allow you to do the types of calculations I alluded to, where you could run a simulation to where you have maybe an iron sulfur cluster treated at the at the at the couple at the couple clustered level, um, and then you have a larger region outside of that, the DFT, and then, you know, and then maybe MM far, farther outside of that, all right? And it'll do that in a subtractive onion type approach. And this is just the documentation, which the documentation which you can find on the, um, on the CHARM website, on CHARM.org. This is the, um, you know, we call it, uh, where is it? QCHEM.doc. Uh, QCHEM .doc. Is the, uh, is the name of this file. It's not a Word document. It's just called .doc because it's a documentation file. So this is the qchem.doc file you can find. And it highlights, again, all of the functionality and how you actually, you know, call these things. One of the things that I, I, if you, I didn't mention too much about it, uh, but in my functionality slide, you see that there's a PCM, there's a QMM and PCM with qchem. This is what, what I've done here is I, I, I built in, I baked into Charm the functionality that John Herbert implemented in qchem to be able to treat QMM interactions inside of a polarized solvent. So now, inside of CHARM, you can run, you know, kind of protein simulations where you have a ligand that's quantum, a protein that's classical, all of that embedded into a continuum, you know, without having to, um, without having to deal with, you know, 100,000 explicit water molecules. Uh, and then various other things. I'm not going to go through all of these, but if you have questions uh, either now or later, you can email me or, or you know, contact me through QCHEM um, uh, or, you know, through my email, and that'll be, and I'll, I'll help, you know, people out as needed. So the relevant publications here, um, and, uh, and by relevant, I say relevant to me because these are all my publications. There's been a tremendous amount of work done, obviously, um, and, and several reviews that I, I think that I, that I highlighted um, that are very nice, you know, QMMN reviews. On things, but this is the work that I've done with this guy here in bold being the, um, you know, kind of the basis of today's webinar, and then recent work done here with the M scale and with um, the vibrational work with Yihan on QMMM, uh, and then some other reaction coordinate stuff, charm reference, the QCHEM reference, uh, original replica path, uh, reaction path framework, uh, oh, and charming itself, where we have implemented the ability to set up some QMMM calculations. So acknowledgments, um, obviously there's a whole list of people, everybody who doesn't know Yihan, there's a picture of me and Yihan in Ireland last year, and uh, Milan Hodacek. So the people up here have, have, you know, have largely I've worked with on the QMM side, the multi-scale side over the years. Milan, uh, I've had a long-standing collaboration with, he's in uh, Slovenia. Uh, Bernie Brooks is where I did my postdoc and obviously where a lot of this work initiated. Um, Yihan, obviously, uh, Peter and Aunt, Peter and Andrew at uh, at ANU, um, you know, really helped catalyze this thing because I was in grad school and I had no idea how to do any of this stuff. I wanted to start programming in QCAM. You know, I didn't have the source. I, you know, I didn't have anything, and they, you know, hosted me for you know about a about a month and a half to to really help me, you know, learn how to get started on this stuff. Paul Sherwood, who's at Darsbury Labs. Uh, he's a Games UK guy, but he really helped also in the early days, um, you know, teach me a lot about QMMM. Um, and then An, Jay, 
Joe and Awesome. Um, you know, all were authors on, you know, these series of papers that I kind of talked about and had great collaborations with. You know, this group of folks here are the charming, are the charming people who really helped develop the website that I think it will be a valuable tool for people who are making the conversion from running only quantum calculations with QCAM to running QMMM calculations, because uh, obviously a lot of extra complication comes in that deals with this, that deals with the pro that you have to deal with the protein. So working on getting the, um, you know, the, the, the charming website up and running and optimize the ability to, to streamline these setups is, is, a, is a pretty big effort. And, uh, and then here are the QCAM team who uh, helped out a lot in, in organizing, obviously, this webinar. Uh, Zinting, ML, Mary Sue, Yihan, and the QCAM board for allowing me to do this. Um, and then, obviously, all of you folks for signing up and staying around. And I will um, take any questions. I should thank, um, obviously, this is an older picture of my group uh, at USF, and thank uh, the NHLBI for, uh, and IH for funding and USF for startup funding. And thank all you guys again, and I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lee, for this inspiring lecture. And now it is time for questions. Uh, right now I see some questions already arriving. Uh, reading loudly for the audience because the audience doesn't see the questions like I do. The first question comes from uh, Edward Akai. Akai. Uh, would it be problematic to generate the ligand with the Charm 36 and the protein with Charm 22. Okay, that, that's yep. That, that's an excellent question. Um, and the answer to that is is um, no, actually, because the the Charm 22 force field really hasn't changed. And you're and, and I didn't update the scripts, but I, I it's a very good question. The answer the, the answer to the question is no. The Charm 22 and the Charm 36, the Charm 22 protein force field and the Charm 36 um, generalized force field are perfectly compatible. The, the trick is, is, you may have noticed you have to use this, there's a keyword called flex when you read in the parameters. And that, that activates Charm to use the flexible parameter reader. And that was coded in to be able to handle um, any, any, any just for, format problems between the parameter files. So the answer to that question is no. However, what's happened now, Alex has very recently released um, a full collection of everything's been ported to C36. You know, there's a C36 protein um, topology and parameter file now, and that ties in a little bit more straightforwardly with the, with the C36 um, CGNFF file. That being said, um, the differences between the C22 protein uh, file and the C36 protein file are, are really minor. Maybe a few atoms have been renamed, um, and that's about it. The parameters have not changed very much since C22. So I, I, hope, that answers, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks. If uh, the person asking question wants to clarify further, he's welcome to write. Uh, meanwhile, let's go to another question from Sai. Uh, Vankayala, Vankayala. Mm -hmm. how do we use different body sets for different atoms in the input script? Okay, so if, if that's what you, if you want to run a mixed basis calculation, so you would follow the, so you would take the exact same functionality that you would use in a QCAM calculation by itself. And in a QCAM calculation by itself, let's say you have the water diamond, right, and you want to run it full quantum, but you want one water to be 631G star and one water to be 631G star star. You would use, you would tell the basis uh, command that it needs to be mixed. And then you would, in, down below there is a, a new uh, section that you would add to your QCHEM control file that would, that would specify atom by atom, you know, what basis to assign to what atom. So it, it would have to be done manually right now. However, it wouldn't be hard for me to um, add that as an option to the to the QM to the QMMM interface in Charm, such that users could very easily do that. That'd be straightforward to do. Okay. Uh, well, let's take two more questions, uh, which now I see they appear. One is from David uh, Chat Chatfield. 
I may ask him, he first to say that it is a great information uh, that you gave me, then uh, he's asking for whether the slides will be available with the references and the scripts, uh, it will be helpful if they are available. Yes, absolutely, I can do that. I, I, I can work with the, um, obviously I have to work with you guys to, um, so, the, so the webinar, uh, will, and so, the, so the webinar will be available on YouTube like all of these have been um, in the not too distant future, um, but the slides could be made available and the, uh, and the scripts, of course. And I, I can work with the QCAM folks to um, maybe have a link, maybe have that hosted on the QCAM website, or I can, um, or I can post those on the, uh, the Charm forms maybe um, as well. So e either one of those uh, can be done. So the answer to that will be yes, let me work with them, and then maybe uh, you guys can post an announcement or send out email to the people who registered to um, to update them once we get that worked out. And also, this uh, program webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on YouTube in its entirety, including the questions. Now, let's go to the next question from Kadir Tim and uh, He's asking how difficult it is to do a calculation with a non-standard amino acid residue in the QM region. No, uh -huh. So that okay, that's a great question. Um, we run into these problems quite often because the setup the setup of that can be a little bit tricky. Um, so if you want a non-standard amino acid in the QM region, it so it depends. So it depends on a little bit what you're trying, what you're wanting to do. It, the question is, if our, all you want to do is treat a non-standard amino acid quantum mechanically, um, that really is that's going to be trivial. Um, you you set it up the same way you would any other calculation, and then you really just say, okay cut between the carbon alpha and the, you know, and the carbon bond, or the carbon alpha and the carbon beta bond. So get the side chain, treat it quantum mechanically, run a simulation. Um, if you're interested in doing reactions, then it's, you know, then obviously it gets more complicated, or if you want to do um, excited states or things like this, um, there, there are some other complications that have to do, there are some other factors that go in, but it, it really won't be that hard. Um, again, the hardest part is the hardest part of this is getting your protein set up classically to have non-native amino acids um, as part of it. Because you have there's some there's some tricks there was not tricks but there are some things that you have to do in the charm topology file to make that happen. And if the and if and if the non-native amino acids don't exist by default already in the charm topology and parameter files, then you have to go to the charm generalized force field. And you've got to define your non-native amino acid there. Then you have to write a patch that essentially that replaces your old amino acid with your new non-native one. So it's it's not it's not a hard process, but it's, there are just a number of pieces that, that go into making that happen. Um, so I'd say on, on a on a on a scale of difficulty from one to ten, and I'm talking about the charm scale of dif difficulty, not the Q not the QCM scale of difficulty in terms of running calculations. Um, that's maybe a that's maybe a six six out of ten maybe seven out of ten, um, and I think the QCM scale difficulty ranges from from probably one to two on the charm scale difficulty in terms of setting calculations up. So much it's so much easier to do in QCM that is. Probably this will be the final question. One more question I see here from uh, uh, Edward Akai. And he's asking, what happens if a non-quantum particle comes into the QM region, such as the water into the binding box? Well, that <laughs> okay, Lee, can you answer this? Yep, that's a that's a great question. And there are um, so right now, the, so the, so so to answer the question directly, what happens is that water would still be treated classically. So if it moved in, it would still it would still be treated classically. Um, that being said, there are a number of methods that, that, that are available to handle this type of problem. Uh, you know, Don Trular has developed a bunch of these, uh, or a series of these, High Lin, who's at uh, UC Denver, has uh, been working on this as well, um, to, to develop these types of methods to, to, um, to, seamless, to seamlessly handle a transition of a classical particle into a quantum region. Those, those methods um, can be quite expensive because it requires you running a whole bunch of extra quantum calculations. Um, 
what is what is available already in Charm that should work with QCAM out of the box is a method called FIRES, and, I, and it's an acronym, F-I-R-E-S, and I can't remember what it stands for, but it's, it was developed by uh, Benoit Roux's group, uh, Chris Rowley, uh, the first author, and what that does is they put, a, they put a boundary potential around your quantum region, essentially. So if you, you take your quantum region and then some area around it, and you, you encapsulate that in some type of boundary potential, and then what that boundary potential does is it prevents this from happening. It prevents any it prevents any unwanted water molecules from wandering in um, accidentally, and it's a small it's a small restraint it's a small perturbation on you know on, on a fully unrestrained system. But they showed in their paper that that um, that you get the, you get the same answers and you get the same you get the same uh, performance um, as you would in, in something where this doesn't happen. This concludes our webinar. We would like to thank Dr. Lee Woodcock for his excellent presentation. If you've not tried QChem lately, we have come a long way, and we invite you to utilize our two-month full-feature demo, which you can request by hitting the orange free demo button on our website. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact us by emailing either Jinping or Yi Han at the email addresses noted on your screen. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation and see you at the next webinar.